Well, welcome, guys. This is, uh, even though we're talking about an elderberry wine making workshop, we're going to talk about how you make wine out of anything. So, really, it's understanding winemaking in general. Now, are there very many grape growers in here? Okay, I'm probably going to offend a couple of you, so <laughs> I don't really mean to do that all that bad. You'll really understand what I'm getting to in a minute. Oops, wrong, wrong way. Here we go. Um, this is what people think about winemaking. This is the way it was a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago, and I'm going to talk about grapes to begin with because that's what they were predominantly making wine out of because they didn't have a cheap alternate form of sugar to increase the alcoholic content. Why, uh, grapes are the only material used to make wine outside of honey because it was the highest sugar content of any fruit or vegetable. It had enough sugar if you picked the correct grape out of the 8,000 that we have available, it would make a 10% alcohol solution, which is what's necessary, that's the magic number, if you will, to store in a wood barrel or a Greek amphora. In other words, to store for some period of time. Until we had sugar, that was basically it. And they would take honey and try to increase the sugar content of beer, or you would make honey wine, which is mead, and that's basically what you had. So our other fruit crops were kind of waiting for a while. Now on top of that, at that time, we were using the indigenous wild yeast to do our fermentation. Transportation was the reason. If you're using horse and wagon to transport your fruit from your vineyard into your winery, in a couple hours you haven't gone very far. So, well, in fact, what, and what most people don't realize is that you as a farmer, you would grow your grapes and you'd make wine and you would make wine and you would make wine and you all then brought it into the central, the central chateau all right, and where they blended it together because of transportation. So a lot of our historical things are due to the lack of good transportation. Today, if I wanted to buy grapes from New Zealand, I can get them here without any trouble at all. So we don't have that. So at that time, 100 years ago, where the fruit came from was very important because the indigenous wild yeast was different. Depending on the growing conditions, you were going to get one particular yeast one year, and the different growing conditions, you'd have a totally different yeast the next year. And the yeast is one of the most important things in the winemaking process. Today, we have cultured all those yeasts. We've got over 1,800 wine yeasts available to professional winemakers. So that's really the major differences between Cabernet is different wine yeast, depending on where they are. This is why in the 1976 wine judging between California and France, the judges couldn't tell where the wines came from. Because Mondavi had brought over the Bordeaux yeast to Napa Valley. Everybody was using the same yeast, so you had Bordeaux yeast, good quality fruit, you had good quality wines. They couldn't tell where they came from. Okay? Also, the chateau that you were going to be selling to would tend to tell you the style in which you're going to make your wine because they're going to blend it all together. You, know, you just cannot transport a fruit crop very far in hot weather. So because of that, there was the localized styles of how you make wine because, again, of transportation. Today, there's winemakers here in Missouri that are trained in France, in uh, Australia, California, and they're winemakers in Missouri. So they bring all that expertise, and, and you really, it's the, the different type of styles now are kind of up for grabs. It's just whatever you want to do. So there's no one particular style. In the, uh, the Somali, we'll tell you this little area of Italy over here, their wine tastes this way. That's because they're still historically making it the way they did 200 years ago, and they haven't branched out. Okay, okay so we're going to be a little more scientific, if you will, than the old-time winemaking. So where the fruit comes from really today makes no difference. And what we need to do is find a good quality source of good fruit. Consistent source. Now everybody here knows that growing fruit is farming. Farming is one of the most uh, un unnerving things and uncertain things that there is. So that's why you need to have your crops spread out. So if you have a hailstorm somewhere, you're not wiped out. Uh, in Kansas, we have a situation where our, a lot of our wineries want to have everybody estate grown. 
that doesn't work because if you have any localized anything that goes on, a hailstorm, <laughs> tornado, which is I'm not certain which one of those is more more normal to have, but uh, in either case, you lose your crop, you're out of business for a year, okay, and that's not a good thing to do. So, all right, for wine, there are five things it takes to make wine. You notice I didn't say anything about grapes yet, okay. And these are, uh, all these slides, you've got copies of those, you know. The five ingredients for wine is water, sugar, yeast, and basically the fermentation process is in an aqueous solution, yeast eats the sugar and turns into carbon dioxide and alcohol. That's what happens across the board. Where we get the sugar in, in wine, it comes from the fruit that we're using. In beer, you have to convert it from the carbohydrate into a fermentable sugar, that's the brewing part of beer. Otherwise, the processes are very, very similar. The flavor, obviously, that's what it's going to taste like. And the acid, I bring that out separately because you need to have the acid in the right pH range or you're going to get a lot of bacterial spoilage. And also, it doesn't taste right. It'll taste flabby. As I showed everybody last night, if you have a wine that tastes a little bitter in the aftertaste, Put a couple drops of lemon juice in it. Its pH is just slightly too high. Our taste buds are incredibly sensitive. They're much more sensitive than any of the meters that we have. What I did last night, you couldn't even measure on a pH meter, but you could certainly taste the difference in the wine. Okay? Uh, there's also five basic tastes in wine, and our whole goal here is to have a balance among these tastes, which is, again, the flavor, Tannin, whether we put that in by oak or it's naturally in the fruit or we put it in by other means. Uh, the sugar, if you have residual sugar in your wine, you know, sweeter wines. Uh, again, the acid and the alcohol. And the whole idea here is to have the right blend and to have the balance. Uh, as an international wine judge, I also do some amateur wine judging. One of the most notable uh, problems with amateur wines is they always run the alcohol way too high. Okay, uh, you don't want it high. Uh, the palate here in the center of the United States is typically around 12% alcohol. Okay, go higher than that. Uh, California does it all the time, and a lot of their things are just too hot for the most most of our palates here in the Midwest. And if you like bourbon, <laughs> okay, run your wine up. You know, it's it's again what it tastes like to you is what you want. So. <clears throat> The process is to make wine. The first thing we need to do is get the fruit, whatever we're going to make it out of. Obviously, today we're talking about elderberries, but all of this is equally as applicable to pomegranates, to kumquats, to grapes, to anything. Okay? And then the question becomes, do you grow or do you buy it? We have a little controversy in the state of Kansas that oh, fruit grown in the state of Kansas has got to be better than anybody else's. That's not true. Okay? Uh, just because I grow it, doesn't mean it's the best in the world, okay? There's a few people that believe that, but um, anyway. Uh, typically, if you're any winery of any size out in California, buys most of their fruit. They do not grow most of the fruit. And one of the things I try to explain to people in the, for the wine business is that growing fruit is production agriculture. Making wine is like a chemical process. They're two different. They're both labor-intensive, capital-intensive, technology-intensive businesses. How many here are registered sprayers? Okay. That's one of the things you need to do when you grow, right? I don't have to do that if I'm just making wine. See, so right there, the technology is rather different. Okay. Next thing you have to do is process the fruit. How do I get it from the field or from my buyer or whatever into a scenario that I can start fermenting it? And I separate that as a separate step because it means a lot of different things to different who, where, wherever you are. We harvest our grapes. We're harvesting in August and September. Just like around here. What's the temperature in August and September? Kind of warm. We'll chill the grapes for two days at 35, 30 to 30, 40 degrees to get them down so when we press them, we don't get a lot of bad tastes. Okay? Uh, and that's what I'm talking about, the processing side of the fruit then the fermentation, then finishing, which most people totally ignore, especially in home winemaking. But that's one of the most critical parts of the whole thing. Just the fermentation, you can get there, anybody can do that. The wild yeast used to do that. In fact, if you didn't do anything, it will ferment. 
It may not taste very good, but it will ferment. And that's one of the problems with using the wild yeast. That's why they had a vintage year every about 15 years was because everything came together just right to have the right yeast and that made a really nice wine. The rest of the time it was, uh, it was okay but it varied a lot. California of course has figured this out and that's why every year now is vintage year in California. Because in the, the new way of making wine, uh, the more scientific way, we make up for the things Mother Nature didn't put in there. We're not worried about her unpredictability on that type of yeast anymore. We put in our own cultured yeast. And then bottling. And I'm going to show you, that's the reason for a lot of this stuff around here. What I'm going to go through is how we do all this and show you some of the equipment and show you where to get the equipment, especially for home winemaking. It doesn't have to cost you a fortune to do this. You can spend a lot of money, but it doesn't have to be there. There's a few things you really need, and later on in the afternoon, we're going to be, uh, you have to find one of the hydrometers to be around, so maybe after lunch, kind of congregate, or maybe I can find an extra one or two. Okay. People are mainly used to grape wine, so I'm going to start with that just to give a basic process. If we're taking white grapes or white wine, you'll take the grapes. There's nothing to be gained by fermenting on the skins. And this is an important part because later on there's a lot to be gained by the skins. So we just de-stem and press, get the juice, ferment the juice. Okay, that's the basics of, of white grape wine. Red wine, all the color and most of the flavor comes out of the skin. So we want to soak on those skins. So we de-stem and crush and soak and you'll get Various Cabernet makers will tell you, oh, mine's very special because I do a 23-day soak on the skins and somebody else says, no, I do 28. And so, you know, That's one of the variables that we deal with is how long do you soak on those skins? Because the fermentation's already gone, oh, it's already completed by that time. They're just continuing to soak to extract everything they want. If the longer you soak it, the more tannins you're going to get, the longer you're going to have to age it. So there's a lot of decisions that you have to make right up front and that actually sets the aging schedule and a lot of other things. Uh, then the last thing is rosé or blush wines. That's treating a red like a white. Just press it and get the juice. Uh, this is also white Zinfandel or blush wines. Notable great example of this is good old white Zinfandel. Sutter Home had already filled up all their red wine tanks. They had extra Zinfandel. So they said, what do we can do? We'll just press it and get the juice, put it in the tanks and fermented it. Well, then what do we do with it? Because it's a pinkish type juice. Well, they sweetened it up to 4% sugar, and now it's the largest single-selling wine in the United States. Not bad for an accident, so. Um, now, the five things to make wine. Back to water, sugar, yeast, fruit flavor, tannin, and acid. For things other than grapes, we are going to have to add water oftentimes, okay? Uh, we definitely have to add sugar. We're going to choose the yeast. So you see there's a lot of things that are going to go on. So first and foremost, let's talk about the water. How many people here have uh, their own wells? You have no problems, unless you have bad water. Does your water taste good? Okay? If your water tastes good, you use it in the fermentation process. Uh, if it tastes like, if it tastes horrible, don't do that. Yeah? How about IPH water? Seven, eight, seven. Most, most, uh, the pH is on all that. We'll, we'll correct that later on. But believe it or not, most city water uh, supplies are around 8 pH. 7, 6 to 8. And around Wichita, I taught a course. I had all the uh, students bring in their water supplies. And you can track where the water, their water comes from by the pH of the water. You can tell if it comes from Lake El Dorado or Lake Cheney or a water well. <laughs> and if it was Derby, it was just about as hard as this table. So, you know, that was real easy. Uh, so if you like your water, use it. If it's really hard water, bring in some other water. Okay? Buy, buy a bottle, you know, bottle of water, five gallons of bottled water, whatever you're going to need. Yes, ma'am? If it goes through a water softener? Not a problem. As long as it tastes good. That's, that's the key. Now, how many of you have chlorinated water? Okay. You'll notice in the, uh, the wine books, they'll tell you you're supposed to mix up your must and wait 24 hours. 
before you put in the yeast. Nobody ever tells you why. It's always well to stun the wild yeast to do this and do that. No, it's actually to let the chlorine get out of the water. Chlorine kill, will kill the yeast. So if you want to, that's why in wineries we do not use chlorine to sterilize tanks, much to the health department's chagrin. They, they don't quite understand that the first time or two you tell it to them. Uh, on the floors, yeah, but any little bit of chlorine there will kill the yeast. And obviously we want the yeast, so you don't want chlorine. That's why you wait 24 hours. The other thing to do is get yourself a bucket of water and just put it out, you know, just let it wait 24 hours. Secondly, what's the temperature of your water? Any ideas? Tem the temperature of your water. Yeah, it tastes cool when we drink it, right? All right, most yeast doesn't want to work much below 50 degrees. So if you have a really cold, like I used to live in Colorado, our water came out of the bottom of Horse Tooth Reservoir at 40 degrees. You had to wait 24 hours just to let that stuff warm up. Okay? Uh, so you want to look at your water temperature, and if it's too cool, add a little warm water. You know? Yes? I heard that uh, if you have chlorine in your water, you could boil it out of it. It. Fluorine? Yeah. Uh, you can, but it'll come right out just like chlorine does. That's what I mean. Yes, about chlorine. Now. Chlorine? Okay, yeah. Chlorine. chlorine. You can boil it, but why, why go through all that? All you have to do is wait 24 hours. You ever seen a glass of water that's sitting, you know, just sitting around the counter, and it's got those little bubbles in it? That's chlorine. That's the chlorine coming out of the water. So just wait 24 hours if you have chlorinated water. Otherwise, you can go right ahead and put the yeast right on in. We, we're on a large aquifer. We, use, uh, we have very wonderful water where we are. We mix up must and put the yeast in immediately. Okay, as, soon as, as long as everything, the temperature's right. The fruit flavor. Obviously, that's the fruit you're going to choose. And I'm going to talk a little, lot more about that. Tannin, in most of our fruits, we don't have a lot of tannin. The tannin comes from, in grape wine, from the skin and the seeds. And you can get tannin. There's grape tannins that you can add. You can also pour in tea. Okay? As a commercial winery, you can't do that, but as an amateur, you can. So there's a lot of ways to do things when you're an amateur. The acid. The acid you use, I have a slide a little bit later, you're supposed to use the principal acid that's in the fruit when you're commercial winemaking. When you're an amateur, you can do the thing we call acid blend, which is comes in little bottles like that. <laughs> and it's a blend of tartaric, citric, and malic. Okay? And that's fine to use. Or you can use citric or a variety of other things. And that's what this is about. Here's a few selections of, of different fruits for you. And if you'll notice real quick, apples, crab apples, that's all malic acid. Um, so if I was going to make apple wine and I needed to add acid to it, I would have to legally use malic acid because that's its principal acid. Can I Sir. I'm over 50 and I can't see fine print, so actually on the back of your, your PowerPoint presentation, I blew up those slides. Okay. Like that. <laughs> I figured that if I can't see it, you can't see it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's okay. I'm just going to refer to it. It's in there. You can look at it. So there's probably almost everything you can think of in there. The major points are most other fruit, blackberries, cherries, cranberries, etc., are all citric acid. And citric acid is a little easier to come by. Grapes turn out to be the only thing that have tartaric acid. So the acid blend is actually putting an acid in that's not naturally in that fruit. It tastes a little different. It buffers a little differently. You know, for, your, for an amateur wine, you don't really worry too much about that. Where we're, worried, where we're measuring it with pH meters, you have to worry about that. Uh, the other thing about tartaric acid is, for grapes, you have to cold stabilize them when you're finishing them. Because there's potassium in the, the actual grape must. The potassium will combine with the tartaric acid. It's an unstable chemical system. And it precipitates out potassium bitartrate which most of us know is cream of tartar. Okay? And yeah, it works really well. You can <laughs> take it and bake with it. Um, 
We also call it wine diamonds, and it's a, a real fun thing to get rid of sometimes in the tank, to clean out the tanks with it. You'll sometimes see it in the bottom of people's wine that they don't know to stabilize it properly. The cold stabilization for that is like 28 degrees for two weeks. Well, there's ways to do it a little quicker, but that's the simple and easy way. Some places will just put their wines outside for the winter. That'll be enough to do it. If you're going to age your Cabernet for two years in an oak, uh, it'll precipitate out during that time. So it's a time and temperature thing. If you want to make some money off your wine, you want to make your wine in, in October, November, and have it in the bottle so it's sold for Christmas, you, you do learn to do the cold stabilization in the freezer. So, and again, when you start to put acid back in, uh, small adjustments, citric is usually very, very nice. Malic will take a lot. Okay, because it just, it, it's not a strong acid. Okay, this is the traditional wine recipe uh, that we're going to go through. And it's for anything. Grapes, kumquats, elderberries, etc. First of all, you're going to have somewhere between 1 and 16 pounds of fruit <laughs> per gallon. Now, grapes are like a little mini canteen. That amount of water, they have the right amount of water. And they choose the, we, we've chosen about 80 to 100 varieties out of the 8,000 varieties, they have the right amount of water. They have the right amount of sugar, they have the right yeast on the bloom, and they have the right amount of acid. Okay? You can make some really nice wine out of table grapes that historically those were not wine grapes because they didn't have the right things. Once you know how to adjust that, you can make some very, very nice wine. The entire Wine industry of Florida is based off of table grapes, wine, grapes that would not normally be thought of as, you know, grapes for material for wine. Now, in general, and these are just some rules of thumb that I've come up with, white grapes, you're going to need about 13 to 16 pounds because you're pressing them, okay? You're not 100% efficient. If you overpress, you start getting bad tasting things, so you can't press too far. There's some enzymes you can use to help you, but on the average, it takes 13 to 16 pounds to get one gallon of juice, and that's about what you get from a grape plant. So every grape plant produces about one gallon of wine. Just, again, another rule of thumb. Uh, for red grapes, we're going to soak on the skins, and that way it actually disintegrates part of the fruit and it extracts the, fr the, the juice out better, so you're typically around 12. What this turns out to be, for those that like you know, gallons per ton, this is about 175 gallons per ton, and this works out to about 150 gallons per ton. Okay? Um, st uh, fruit, everything except stone fruit. Anything that doesn't have a pit in it, believe it or not, it's just about the same as grapes. Okay, you're going to get one gallon of juice for about 12 pounds of fruit. Stone fruit, you've got the stone in there, and just depending on whether it's cherries or peaches or how big they are and things like that, it's anywhere from 14 to 16 pounds. Okay? So when you want to start making five gallons of wine, you start looking at 80 pounds of fruit. If you're going to do grapes. If you're doing elderberries, you're not going to use that. That's the amount of juice, but it's the concentration. How, what is the concentration or the flavor to water ratio? Most fruit, other than grapes, has a much more concentrated flavor. Also, that's cut, cut in half in, in your mind a blackberry. Where is the flavor and color in a blackberry? Throughout the blackberry. Strawberries the same. I mean, most fruit is that way. So you can actually extract flavor and color throughout the, the fruit itself. So you don't need as much fruit because there's just not as much water there. Now, that's why we're going to add water. The standard fruit wine recipe starts at about three pounds per gallon. So you see that's one quarter of what we do with grapes. That's how much more water they have in them as a little, a little mini canteen. So whether it's elderberries or blackberries or raspberries or whatever, you can start at three pounds per gallon. And we're going to treat them like a red wine. We're going to soak them in there through the primary fermentation process so you extract out as much of that as you can. Okay? Uh, commercially, we can vary that length of time a lot. Amateurs usually need to bring it out earlier uh, just to, because of, of logistics and things. 
Okay, with a lot of our fruit, we don't have a whole lot of sugar, which I think I can go back. Uh, there's a percentage sugar weight. Again, don't worry about reading it. The whole point is there's not much sugar there in some of these things. Um, if you'll take a look at cranberry, 4.3. Anybody's eating a cranberry knows there's not much sugar in cranberries, okay? But think about the fact that we're going to dilute this about 4 to 1, so that sugar goes way, way down real quick, okay? I can guarantee you, I doubt there's anybody in here that could actually take 100% elderberry juice, make it into wine, and drink it. Uh, I tried, okay? Uh, years ago. <laughs> it doesn't work. So, so we're going to end up adding some amount of sugar. And typically, if you had zero sugar in there at all, you'd be about two pounds of sugar per gallon. So when we want to do, you know, say, elderberry wine or, or whatever, mulberry wine, whatever, sugar right now is about 60 cents a pound, 60 to 70 cents a pound, not too bad. If you want to make a mead, which is honey, honey is $2.40 a pound. In other words, it costs a lot more. So... Uh, so you need to figure out where your sugar is coming from. Type of sugar. Does it make a difference? What, what kind of sugars do we have? Cane sugar and beet sugar and something in between that nobody will let us know what it is. In other words, it's a blend of the two. Okay. Now, I've got two jars of sugar. And I'm just going to pass this around. They're marked A and B. All right. One of them is cane sugar. One of them is beet sugar. Smell them, and just we'll, we'll vote as to which one's cane sugar, either A or B. Okay, just it'll take a few minutes to get get around. So, yeah. Yes and no. The, uh, what they use for the final ferment, the, the final carbonation, right. yeah, they want to use fructose. You go to a beer, a, a wine making supply place or a beer making supply place, and they're going to tell you, you need to use invert sugar. Okay? Let me explain about sugar. This is sucrose. This is table sugar. Sucrose in an, an acidic environment for 24 hours, I like put acid with it in wine must, inverts into Fructose and glucose. Okay, it's all that it inverts the sugar. The whole point is the yeast can't eat sucrose; it has to eat some sort of inverted sugar. And why I said yeast is very important: there are yeasts that like glucose over fructose. There are yeasts that like fructose over glucose, and they make different flavors when they do that. And then there's one like K1 who just doesn't care; he eats everything equally. Okay. So that's the thing. You need to, your regular sugar is fine as long as you, you're putting it in, in, you know, in this particular scenario with the acid. If I wanted to carbonate the wine later on, then an invert sugar is, is helpful, but not even necessary then if there's some acid with it. Now, again, you go. When I first started making wine, people, the, the wine making shop people said, "Buy. You got to have this invert sugar." At the time, sugar was 29 cents a pound. And they wanted to sell me their invert sugar for $2 a pound. I was doing 200 gallons of wine. That was going to cost a lot of money for that sugar. Why did, they, why did I need to do that? Because they sold that sugar and the grocery store sold the other. Okay? Uh, as you go around here, I'll explain the difference between cane sugar and beet sugar. Cane sugar is fairly pure. Beet sugar, the only difference between the two chemically is eight parts per million of sulfur more in beet sugar than there is in cane sugar. Does the yeast care? No. Okay, cane sugar, if it says cane sugar on the package, it's cane sugar. If it doesn't say in the package, it's either beet sugar or a blend of the two. Everybody's very proud of the fact that it's cane sugar, and they're going to charge you more for it. So, um, Now, a couple other neat things is, if when you start doing more than a gallon of wine, this thing that add one cup is kind of a pain. It's a lot easier to weigh things out. So here's a little conversion for you. A cup of sugar is about 0.45 pounds. Now an interesting factoid here 
In 1900, the average American ate seven pounds of sugar a year. In 1990, the average American ate 157 pounds of sugar a year. You go, there is just no way. That's like a half a pound a day. Or in other words, a little more than a cup of sugar a day. One root 44 Coke, and you just did that. <laughs> okay? And again, it's from the fructose too, the high fructose corn syrup. Um, we're consuming a huge amount of sugar in this country. Okay? Uh, there's about a quarter cup, half a cup of sugar in every 12 ounce Coke. It's 12% sugar. Now, when you dissolve it, and there's a helpful hint here, if you take two, pounds of sugar, two cups of sugar and one cup of water, you're going to get two cups of sugar solution. So, ladies, if you ever needed to go from dry measure to liquid measure, or guys that, that bake or, or cook, which I do, uh, that's a real nice thing to know. Uh, it's a way to convert from the, the dry to the liquid. Uh, but when you're actually doing a large amount of wine, and one of the things we have to do commercially is if we sweeten our wine with sugar, uh, we have to look at the increase in volume. And every 13.2 pounds of sugar will give you one gallon of, of liquid that you've generated. So um, the acid, you're going to have some amount of acid. And uh, typically you notice in teaspoons here, not a whole lot. You notice here I say one teaspoon of acid blend raises the, uh, the must acid level 0.15. We want most wines to be in the 0.6 range to begin with. Grapes have the acid already there. They're anywhere from 0.6 to 1 in the amount of acid. Okay? If you're using citric acid, it's not as tartaric. This has a, is mainly tartaric. It's not as strong an acid, so you have to add a little bit more. Okay? Uh, next thing we're going to do is we have to protect the wine while it, after it ferments. So when you first start the wine, you typically put in an antioxidant. This is the sulfites. Now, I know we've got some organic growers in here. Sulfites are not a dirty word. Sulfites are antioxidants that we use, and it's perfectly fine if it's used in the way it's supposed to be. You know, too much water can kill you. Too much of anything is bad. Wine, the amount of sulfites that are in wine is dependent upon the pH of the wine. The pH we like is typically around 3.2 to 3.6, and so you're anywhere from 30 to 45 parts per million is all you need in wine. Where people had a problem with sulfites before was asthmatics on salad bars. I can remember in the late 70s, you go into one of the places that had a salad bar and you could smell the sulfur off of the salad bar because they were spraying it on there. They were spraying it on in the parts per thousand range. So we're a thousand times less than what, where people reacted to it. By the way, it was only asthmatics. And how many people here have asthma? See, probably nobody here is allergic to sulfites. But the federal government, we are still in prohibition in the United States. It is legal for us to put a poison symbol on a wine label, but it's illegal for us to say, check with your doctor about possible health benefits. Okay? They're trying to do everything to discourage it. So they said, gee, we've got a problem here. There's some sulfites in wine. Therefore, you've got to put this label on there. I went to a conference over in Europe. And the whole idea was to be able to sell wine to Europe. And they said, the first thing you're going to do is take that statement off, the, off your label. Because to them, it was an insult. The second thing was our government warning about pregnant ladies should not consume alcoholic beverages, and et cetera, et cetera. So they, then they're, they're adamant you have to get rid of that thing, too. That was one study done on alcoholic pregnant ladies who had a minimum three ounces of alcohol every day of their pregnancy. Now, let's put it in perspective. If I would have had three ounces of alcohol every day during my wife's pregnancy, the kids probably wouldn't be right. So, you know, <laughs> this whole thing, and it was, it was one study. It was never repeated. And it was just there to scare people. Okay? So, we use, and when you first start your wine, you want to put in about 45 parts per million because you're going to wait 24 hours oftentimes, or it takes a while for the yeast to get going. So, it's basically an insurance policy that you're not going to get bacterial spoilage during that first phase of your, uh, of your fermentation. There's a lot of pectin in fruit. We need to put in a pectic enzyme. And uh, there are also yeast nutrient. Yeast 
loves to eat things, and of course the yeast itself. The yeast nutrient, and there's a, in a lot of the books, they tell you get, get it, rack it off. As soon as you see any yeast sediment, get it off of there. No, you don't. The, ye the dead yeast is actually food for the live yeast. So you leave it in there, and one of the, the techniques that they use in a lot of commercial winemaking, especially in California, is called surlees, which means you leave the yeast in there for up to six to nine months. And it, and it does a certain mellowing. So uh, it's not, a lot of these books are just not the right things to have. You've got to be careful with the books. A little later on, in fact, that first table I pulled out of winemaking as a hobby. This book is one of the best home winemaking books that I found. It was written back in the 70s and from Penn State. It's never been updated since the 70s. We have changed our technology a little bit since the 70s. But it's still a really good book and talks a lot about growing grapes and how to prepare grapes and this type of thing. There's also a lot, some information in here that's not very good, okay? That's outdated. Uh, Southwest Missouri State made a nice little home wine booklet. This is about $20. This is, I think three, it was, I don't know if it's still available, it was three at the time. Obviously it's not quite as comprehensive. The nice thing about bo both of them is they've got pictures. And you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, so if you can watch what they're doing, it's a lot handier. So, these are a couple resources. Um, and again, in there, they're going to tell you to do certain things and generally it's okay, but you don't always understand why. By the time you get through with today, you're going to understand why. Okay, how are we coming on the sugar? I see it's, it's moving around here, okay? Let's just give you an idea of some of the, the processing things to do. For grapes, we will de-stem and crush them and then press them. This is actually uh, peaches and a hydraulic press. Okay, that goes up to 6,000 PSI. Peaches will literally destroy a normal wine press because of the, the pit in them, so don't even try. I just saved you several hundreds of dollars. Um, you know, it's here, this is actually blackberries, and we, we freeze the blackberries. So I'll come back to that in a second. Now, so we got all the sugar done. How many think that A is, a is the um, B, uh, cane sugar? How many think B is the cane sugar? You guys are right. What was the difference? Smell. Smell. It's the, the bee cleaner. Okay? Your nose just was able to detect eight parts per million of sulfur. Our senses are really, really very, very sensitive. We just as soon as we learn how to use them, okay, to do that. So that nasty smell in the beet sugar is sulfur. It's sulfur. Yes. Now another thing I was talking about, nobody's really allergic to sulfites because the level of sulfites in well-made wine is below what your body produces. And if I can be a little graphic here, natural gas is odorless. All the odor compounds are sulfite compounds. Okay? Uh, so if you were truly allergic to the low level of sulfites, you'd be dead. And there may be one in 300 million that have that happens to, but it's, it's not very, very... It's very, very rare. Now, grapes, they de-stem, crush, press. Every, all other fruit, first of all, it's hot. Typically when we're picking it, be nice if we could keep it for a little while. What you want to do is freeze it. To be able to get the juice out, you've got to disrupt the cell structure. Grapes are like a little mini canteen. Everything else isn't. So to disrupt the cell structure, we can do one of several things. One, we can put them in a great big pot and boil them. Cool. It takes a lot of energy. And if you're trying to make money off of making wine, that's not such a hot thing to do. We can freeze them. Freezing disrupts the cell structure, which is what we do with all of our fruit. This allows you to collect your fruit and make wine as you want. We make a lot of grape wine, so when we have grape wine coming in, we have to have tankage for our entire harvest at time of harvest. But our non-grape wine, we make all year long. I make 2,000 gallons of elderberry wine every three weeks, okay, because I have the elderberries sitting in frozen storage. And that's what you see here, too. You can see this juice pouring out. That's just from thawing the blackberries. It naturally dejuices and poured right on in there.
Okay, uh, now we're going to play with the hydrometer a little bit. So if you can kind of get around one of the tables uh, that's got the hydrometers, because this is how you're going to set everything. And in home winemaking, this is the most important tool you're going to have, and it's one of the cheapest tools you're going to buy. Uh, Let's see, I probably on one of them, I don't have it on mine, one of them there has got the, uh, the price on it. It's what, six bucks? Yeah, pretty cheap. Most of your winemaking books will not tell you what I'm going to tell you now because they don't understand how to use this guy. It took me a while to figure it out with the help of some winemakers in Napa Valley who were doing a lot of analysis on my wine at the time. Um, this is where you're going to set your alcoholic content in the wine. If you do not know what your specific gravity is to begin with, you have no idea what your alcohol is. And you go, well, gee, is there any way to measure it? Yes, there is. The, the base level machine to do that's a thousand bucks. A little steep for the average home winemaker. Okay? Uh, they have the things called, t uh, 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 it's actually a beer, it's a little saccharometer. A venometer is what they call it. It's absolutely worthless. Okay, don't even, don't even spend money on it. It's in the books and it doesn't really work. It's plus or minus about 50%. That's a little, little wacky. So first off, we're going to set how much alcohol we're going to have. Secondly, we're going to monitor the process. And thirdly, we're going to be able to sweeten our wines back and have a good idea of where we actually have sugar. When we judge wines, even commercially, a lot of our commercial wineries do not have a clue what sugar level they have. After you've done this for a while, you can pretty well taste it and tell within a percent or two. And people will sit there and say, oh, this is a 3% residual sugar wine, and, you know, it tastes like soda pop, which is 12% sugar. It's just way too sugary. So they really don't know how. So what we're going to do is go over the, the hydrometer, but the first thing is, is how do you actually read it? which is this. Now, water is a very, very unique thing. If it wasn't for the fact that water is so squirrely, we wouldn't be here. Water, as it gets close to freezing temperature, expands, becomes less dense. That's why ice floats. If ice didn't float, we'd be a frozen world. Okay? Another thing that it does, it has surface tension. This is that, that jar. Okay? When we put the liquid in there, what's going to happen is it, it climbs up the side of the jar. Okay? That's called the meniscus. Now the problem is, in nice clear liquid, it's really easy to do this. You can read right across here and read that. Okay? Now you see my wine must that I just prepared today. Try doing it with that. It's next to impossible. Now, there's a sneaky way to do this, though. You'll notice that the amount of meniscus is about one graduation. So read the top, subtract one. <laughs> Most of us can do that. It's just a simple thing to do, okay? Um, and we're going to be doing that in a little bit. So that's why, that's why they're on here. So, you know, if nothing else kind of congregate, we'll probably do that. We'll take a break and then we'll be working on that because I want to go back to another slide for a second. Okay, and that is, where do you get your fruit? As a home winemaker, where do you get your fruit? How many people are growing all their own fruit they want to make wine out of? Okay, do you have any excess? Because your next door neighbor may want to buy some from you. Okay, why not? It's legal for you to sell fruit. Okay, not legal to sell wine. The legality of homemade wine in the United States. Every head of a household is allowed to produce 200 gallons of wine per year for their own family's use. It is not legal to even give it to your friends. Now, there's not too many policemen that are going to worry about that, but that's where some of these uh, make-your-own-wine routines that we had one in Kansas got in trouble because they were serving homemade wine to the public, and you cannot do that in the United States. Federal government regulates that. Okay. All right, so first off, you can buy fruit at the store. Remember, we're looking at 80 pounds of fruit. You know, and uh, what was, anybody know what the price of blackberries are? Or blueberries right now in the store. I was just through Sam's Club, so 
$7.59 for two pounds. So, you know, $3 and almost $4 a pound. All right, now I want 80 pounds. Okay, and I'm going to make five gallons. So if you do the math, that gets really, really expensive really, really quick. Okay. Um, you can go to the winemaking shops. Most of them will have concentrates. If you want to make a grape wine, go to the store and buy frozen Welch's concentrate. That works. Okay. Um, this, is, this makes five gallons of wine, and this is a blackberry, and it's $39. Okay. But these things are available. The other thing is, you go out and you pick them from the wild, or from somebody who's growing them. Uh, again, pick them, freeze them. You'll be able to process them when you want to, because I don't know about you, but normally when you're picking, it's very, very hot, and you're fighting the chiggers and the snakes and the heat and everything else, and that's really not the time I want to be making wine. When I started, wine was a real fun hobby during the fall and the, and the winter, because I would go downstairs and turn on the stereo, and and get away from the wife and kids for a little while and <laughs> in my own little world. So that's not what you want to do when it's hot and muggy and this kind of thing. So freezing the fruit really works well. How, what other ways are there to get fruit? Any ideas? All right, you want to do apples. How are we going to do apples? Anybody grow apples? Okay. Yeah. Do you guys make apple cider at all, apple juice? Okay. Are you able to sell it? Hmm. Well, you're not, unless you pasteurize it, you're not allowed to anymore, so I understand. But you can sell it to a home winemaker because the fermentation process is going to will kill all the, the E. coli. Okay? So you don't have to worry about that. So uh, the hardest part of this process is getting the juice and the pressing process. Uh, that hydraulic press you just saw there, that's uh, $11,000. Okay? Uh, a good sized fruit press for an amateur would be, I think they start at about 1500 and they go up. Um, so, get you an idea that it's an expensive thing to be doing. Now, if you take 80 pounds of fruit, think about what 80 pound volume is, there are little wine presses, like little one gallon wine presses, and you'll spend most of a day pressing out five gallons of juice. So, a uh, couple ways to do this is go to a winery and buy some juice from them when they're doing something. You, know, you need to prearrange with them, but you know, as I'm pressing out you know, a thousand gallons of juice, siphoning off five gallons isn't a big deal. Um, so, that's another way to do it. Go to a, an apple orchard that has their own press and get them to press you some. Okay? Um, it's an interesting deal that in the world of grape wine, most grapes are white. There's a few reds. And in the non-grape wine, almost everything is red. There's very few whites. So you like white wine, you got a problem. You're going to probably stick with grapes or do elderflowers. And by the way, elder flowers, you can do rose petals, okay, the, the amount of fruit changes, because obviously it's not fruit, it's petals again, but uh, the same basic recipe works, it's just how much do we put in to flavor it. It's, it's then just a flavoring ingredient. Any questions on where to get, get fruit? I mean, it's best thing again is, if you want, if, you, if you're concerned, wash the fruit, freeze it, and come back to it later when it's, when it's time to process it. Um, uh, with water. So four, four, four and a half gallons or so of water, whatever it works out to, or three and three quarters gallons, and the rest elderberry juice. Because I know that's how much I'm going to have in there. But I'm going to throw the, everything in, into the fermenter right off the bat. Okay? Then you have to measure things, adjust the sugars, etc., that we're going to be doing here in a little bit. But that's what you have to do with your fruits. You, and you have to do this several different times because you need to know how it's going to react. Do I really get that much out of my fruit? These are just averages. You know, there's some elderberries that the, uh, the, the bricks on the fruit is 10% and you get a lot more juice than others where the bricks may be 12% and you're getting less juice. It's just less water is what it boils down to. For winemaking, it's a wonderful thing about winemaking, it's an equalizer. And in that elderberries, we have not seen any difference in the variety of elderberries so far for winemaking. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, and that's just elderberries. And, you know, we've been doing this a lot of years, and we just haven't seen anything yet because we do so much dilution in there. 
On the other hand, blackberries. <clears throat> How many varieties of blackberries are there? Yeah, there's at least 19 that I know of. Okay? We use, well, the, the blackberry that we use and what's in this can is Marion. That comes from the Northwest. Our wild blackberries make pretty good wine, but I can't get a lot of them. Okay? Again, if I want to do 1,000 gallons worth of wine, and we do between 30 and 40,000 gallons worth of wine a year, uh, I've got to have 3,000 pounds minimum. That's a lot of blackberries. In fact, I usually go through about 9,000 pounds of blackberries a year. The uh, Mother Nature is wonderful, <clears throat> and she's got a great sense of humor. Because the blackberry that you want to grow, that great big one with thornless blackberries, is the worst one in the world to make wine out of. Okay? Uh, so usually the thorny ones that you can't get to, and that guy, they make the best wine. Like I said, Mother Nature's got a sense of humor. The, um, there's one variety out in Oregon that's called Evergreen. It's really great. Every, every variety is different. You can get something out of each variety. Evergreen, when you ferment it, tastes like you poured pine salt into your wine. Now, if you like Greek Retsina, you're in great shape, but there's not too many people that like that. It doesn't sell well, okay? And you don't know it because it tastes like a blackberry to begin with, but when it ferments, you get that out of there. And we haven't found a yeast that doesn't do that to it. Uh, so we're still looking at different varieties of blackberries. The same is true for cherries. Uh, tart cherries, Montmorency cherries are different than black cherries. They're different than maraschino cherries. You're going to get different flavors. And when you ferment them, all sorts of, you know, you ferment, it's some aspect of it really gets amplified. And you never know what, and it's dependent upon the yeast again. So you can do a yeast trial of 10 different things, and you get different flavors out of the exact same thing. Okay? Okay. Um, Peaches. We found that cling peaches give you better flavor for wine than freestone peaches. But everybody wants to they grow freestone because they sell better. So uh, sometimes you need to work with your, your local growers and things and decide what they have and then work on how you make wine from that. But it's not a, uh, not a process of you just go here and do it once and you're going to make this great award-winning wine. It doesn't work that way. It takes hundreds of times sometimes to get the right recipe down to have a really, really great tasting wine. Yes? What's the level of your fruit? Pick it, draw them to the lightness of the fruit power. What's been your experience or observation of all that the end product of the wine? To make good wine, you've got to have good, ripe fruit. Period. Yeah, if, it, if it's something other, then no. In grapes, we have ways to check it. They look at the acid. They look at the sugar level. Very few of us anymore will buy grapes according to bricks and sugar level because I can affect those things. I can't affect the flavor. So we go out and we taste the grapes. We harvest when they taste good. Okay? Same thing for the other fruit. It's got to taste good. It's got to be a good... You've got to start with good quality fruit or you're, just, you're already behind the curve. Okay? Uh, so when you're looking at the different stuff, you're going to have to look at how you... You know, where do you get your fruit, what variety it is. I mean, there's a lot to it. That's why a lot of wineries only make four or five wines out of four or five grapes. That's it. Of course, in California, they've got such a market, you can do that and get away with it economically. We've got 51 wines. So, uh, Okay. Other questions about fruit process? Sure. Are you going to put the elderberries through a press like this? Absolutely not. Elderberries and blueberries both have got a... Uh, an oil in the skins, and how many people have experienced the green tarry stuff? Green scum. Yeah. Do you know what that stuff's good for? Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> it might make glue, and that'd be about it, okay? Other than that, it's, a, it's an oil in the skins. Do not press elderberries. Besides which, we've gotten to the point now we really don't press hardly anything post, you know, post fermentation. Even the blackberries you see here, we really don't press them post fermentation because when you're fermenting, and when you get a thousand gallons, and you got all this fruit sitting there, and as it as you drain this out, it acts like a natural filter, and gravity will press it just a little bit. We've seen that you can get about five percent more volume, but the stuff tastes like crap. Okay, so you know you got this wonderful tasting wine. You're going to mix this stuff that tastes really dubious back in. No, we just 
we wear a distillery also. We take it to the distillery and we distill it and get the alcohol out that way. So, so okay, on elderberries, you don't press them. You don't do that with most fruit, really, because it doesn't gain you anything outside of, unless you're going to do it up front. Okay? Uh, again, freezing disrupts the cell structure, makes it a lot, lot easier to press. Now, there's also one other thing. If you go a little too far, uh, peaches we have to be kind of careful with because if we let them thaw too much, then they're too slippery and they don't want to, they don't want to press well. And then we kind of get this slime coming out of the press, which isn't great. So, okay, other questions at all? So w preparing the fruit is really a big thing. It's a major part of the process, but freezing certainly helps. Uh, blueberries, like I said, you don't want to press blueberries either. And a lot of the fruit, if you do anything, and for the home winemaking, I'll show you how to do it here in a minute, but you let them drain out, and I wouldn't even suggest pressing it from anything. Now, what do you do with the what's left over? The, the berry husks and this type of thing that's got alcohol in it. Well, the really fun thing to do is to take it outside and dump it where the birds get it and watch the drunk birds. <laughs> <laughs> they like it. Fruit flies like it too. So, Okay. Now, once we've got our fruit, so we, we've, we've taken our elderberries or whatever, and we, we've... You know, frozen them, we've now destemmed them and they're back in there frozen again, we're ready to make wine. We're going to bring them out, we're going to thaw them, and we're going to dump them into the water, okay? Uh, and again, from the recipes and in this book, uh, there's and you know, a, lot of, a lot of wine making books, they give you recipes. Recipes are a wonderful starting place, but they, have, they do not take into consideration the variations in fruit. So I'm going to show you how to to take into the variation of fruit and do it right instead of basing it off a recipe. If you're doing it totally by a recipe, good luck. Because you're not going to be, you, one, one every five or ten years you'll hit it. It'll be great. The rest of the time you're going to be, what did I do wrong? And by the way, while you're starting to make wine, there are two utensils that are absolutely 100% necessary. That's a spiral notebook and a pen. All right? We had a guy at the uh, Kansas State Fair, won the grand championship amateur wine at the Kansas State Fair. And six months after he made the wine, he had no clue how he made it. He never wrote anything down. So you need to write everything down. This way, the next time you do it, you'll know what to vary. You can only vary one thing at a time if you're going to understand what's going on. So, uh, and that can be as simple as the fermentation temperature. This time you fermented at 50, fermented at 50 degrees, the next time you did it at 60. Okay? You need to know these things, and so that's why it's, it's a really major iterative process. The guys that say, I, I'm going to put in a winery because I love growing grapes. Well, have you ever made wine before? Well, no, but wine makes itself. I'm a grape grower. Okay, great. It's going to take them at least 20 times to learn how to make one wine correctly. Now, considering they get one crop a year, my math says that's 20 years. And that's about how long it takes for a lot of our wineries to get up the curve to where they're making good wine. Okay? And that's off of one fruit. One, in other words, one particular grape. And by that, I mean, you know, Chardonnay or Cabernet or whatever. It, each one of those is different. Okay? So... A quick question on sure. the, uh, pressing the elderberries yeah. to avoid the green... Mm -hmm. What's the, is there, what tricks do you... Don't press them. Don't, I mean, I say, okay, don't press them. You said put them in a bag? Yeah, I'll show you that. I'll show you it in a minute. Okay. We're going to put together and go over some of the equipment. In fact, I'll, I'll just do the equipment right now. Maybe that's a better idea. If you're going to start making wine, we've got the fruit, okay? So we've grown it. We bought it. We got it given to us, whatever. And by the way, you can go to the grocery store and ask them to buy fruit for you, and you're going to pay full fruit price. Uh, this is something I was discussing with several people. Fresh fruit price is typically at least twice what we're going to pay for making wine. So if you're going to go to the, you know, to the grocery store, you're going to pay a lot more for your fruit than if you went to a bulk producer somewhere. Now, the first thing you need is your, quote, primary fermentation vessel. Wonderful term. In fact, here, let me, let me black that out for a little bit. There's my primary fermentation vessel. It looks suspiciously like a white trash can. 
And if you'll notice on the side, it cost me a whole big three bucks. Okay? You don't have to pay a lot for winemaking equipment, but you do have to pay some. All right? You want your primary fermentation vessel, if you're going to be doing juice, you can have it almost, you need a little bit bigger than what you're going to be producing. You're going to make five gallons, you need a six gallon container. A lot of your beer making kits have got a six gallon bucket in them. Those work if you're doing juice. If you're doing whole fruit, you need a container twice as big as what you're going to have in your, your end wine. So if you're going to have five gallons, you need a 10 gallon container. Here's about the cheapest container you can get. Now, secondly, it needs to be white plastic. This does not have the plasticizers in it that they don't come out during the fermentation process. Secondly, when you clean it, you can tell if it's clean or not. Now, that's a big thing. But cleaners, uh, one of the best things to use is OxyClean. Okay, it's an oxygen-based cleaner. Doesn't leave any residual anything there, and it works really well. Or you can go to the winemaking store and spend a lot more money for the same thing. Um, how many here know about bentonite for a cleanse, a colon cleanse? How much does it cost in the health food store? Bunch, right? Here's a, uh, a half a pound of the exact same bentonite in winemaking store, and it's a dollar and twenty cents. Exact same stuff. Okay. So depending on the use and where you get it, it's a lot cheaper. So, uh, all right. So anyhow, this is the best way to come up with your primary fermenter. Next thing you need to do is you need to have some way to measure water. Well, we all got measuring cups and things like that. And, you know, if you start measuring five gallons of water one cup at a time, you learn real quick to find a bucket or something that you calibrate and start using it. Because there's 16 cups per gallon. So there's 80 cups per five gallons. The next thing you need is a straining bag if you're going to do whole fruit. And again, you can buy a very expensive one at the winemaking shops, which we have, and we, have, we sell winemaking supplies. There it is. And it's, uh, what, $6.10 for this straining bag. And the way you put your fruit in there, and you have to tie it with something. Zip ties work really great. And you dump that bag right in there like a big tea bag. Okay? It's kind of a pain to work with. On the other hand, you can go spend, uh, I think it was a dollar and 63 cents for a white nylon laundry bag Walmart. at Walmart. Yes. Okay. Um, whoops. I'm falling apart. Nice thing about this is it fits in here really nice. And guess what? It's got its own drawstring to keep it in place. <laughs> okay. It's Just, bigger than the regular training bag. Yeah, a lot bigger. You put your fruit in there, sir? What about the whole bag? I mean, is there... Not a problem. Is the hole bigger? Yeah, the hole's a little bit bigger, but it's not a problem. Rather bigger? Huh? Rather. Not a problem. Done it a lot. You, when you get finished with this, you can bleach it if you want, which is kind of nice. The other thing is, once and this answers the question you had a little bit ago, once you're through the primary fermentation portion, you, what you want to do is drain it out. Okay? You just pop this off, tie it together, and I, I had in the basement, so I had a rafter right up here. Put a little string around the rafter and just hold it up. And you let the rafter do the work of holding this instead of you doing the work, because I don't want to stand there for half an hour, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and it just drains right out. When it stops dripping, throw it away. This is cheap enough, you can throw it away too, but I, I was cheap. I reused them all the time, so, okay? Also, during the first part of the fermentation, there's two parts of the fermentation. There's primary and secondary. Yeast, during the, the first stage of fermentation called the primary, you're building up the yeast culture. When we use yeast, yeast goes in there at about 100, um, so 10 million cells per liter, I think it is, something like that. That's the concentration you have, and you have to get over uh, a million cells per liter for it to actually ferment. For it to grow and divide and, and create yeast, it needs oxygen. So for the first three, few days, you're actually stirring this. Now, if it's full, full juice, 
It's not a problem. <laughs> That's it. Okay. How do you stir this? Well, actually fairly simply. Remember my deal? I just stirred it. That's all you need to do. Extremely gentle. You're not getting that green tarry stuff out again. Okay. So, for whole fruit, this thing is really great. And again, even though it may look like it, elderberries don't go through that. Even if they did, we don't care. Because we're going to go on with it here in a little bit. You'll see. Uh, you don't crush them at all. Don't crush them at all. You do not have to crush your fruit. If you freeze it, you don't have to crush it. How many people here have had strawberries before? Most everybody. How many have had a frozen strawberry? What happens when you let a frozen strawberry thaw? Do you get a nice, plump, fresh strawberry? No, you get a puddle of juice and a pile of mush. Exactly, that's what goes on. You're disrupting the cell structure. Why work if you don't have to? <laughs> it's just that simple, okay? All righty, once we, once we put everything in here, now we're gonna have to keep the fruit flies out of here because you don't want vinegar. The winemaking process, yeast eats sugar, turns into carbon dioxide and alcohol. Vinegar, the acetobacter is in the air and that turn, that eats alcohol and turns it into vinegar. If you're not clean, you're going to get that infection in here. If you're not careful, it's really easy to have things go wrong. So when you start doing everything, cleanliness is next to godliness. So if you don't like washing dishes, don't make wine. Okay? Because you're going to have to wash everything, and what you want to do is with that oxygen cleaner, rinse everything out. Then we have a sterilizing solution called potassium metabisulfite in water. Okay? That's that same sulfites that we're going to put in the, uh, in the actual um, uh, must. And it, again, it comes in powder form, which is the most reasonable one. It's just a powder form or it comes in these little tablets. The tablets, they're called Camden tablets. They're great for one gallon at a time. The powder is much better for anything bigger than that. These you have to crush with a mortar and pestle. How many people got a mortar and pestle at home? Okay. A few of you do. That's cool. Crush them up and dissolve them. But believe it or not, uh, this tablet, only about a fifth of it is the actual sulfur dioxide. The rest of it is just binders, which tend to float on the top of your wine and crap things up. So I don't like using them. But they're great for one gallon because they give you 45 parts per million in one gallon right off the bat. Okay. Um, so, and it, the cleaners, like I said, OxyClean is one of the better cleaners, but there's cleaners there at the uh, store, uh, the wine shop, which are just fine, and they're really not all that expensive. Uh, the sulfur dioxide solution, you want to put a tablespoon of sulfur dioxide powder in a gallon of water. You can put it in a plastic jug, just cap it off. It's good for about six months, and uh, you rinse everything with that before you start putting fruit in it and things. Every time you put a utensil in it, you rinse the utensil in that first. That's why that sulfur dioxide then is, is in the wine also and doesn't hurt anything. Okay? So you got to be very, very clean because bacterial infections are the second most more, uh, likely thing to happen in amateur wines. And you start getting flavors like acetone, methyl ethyl ketone, ladies, fingernail polish, okay, geranium, and a whole bunch of other things that you really just don't want to taste in wine. Wine should taste like fruit, not chemicals, okay? All right, so we're getting ready to do everything here. So we get our, we figured out that we're going to do elderberries or cherries or whatever else. We have, need a certain amount of water, and we put that water in there first. As I said, you want to be careful about the water temperature. If it's too cold, it's going to take a while for that yeast to start dividing and, and multiplying. Uh, so, you, so usually it's best to, to start your water, get your water out a day in advance if you're going to do that um, and get it going. So it's, so it's room, warmed up to room temperature. Now, if we're going to do apples, apples you want to ferment at 50 degrees. Most white wines that are light, you want to slow them down. The faster you ferment, the more flavor you blow off with the carbon dioxide. So apples are something you want to ferment slowly. Uh, red grape, Cabernet, is typically fermented in four to five days totally, where apples will take three weeks. If you have a fermentation that goes on more than about three weeks, you begin to run the risk of bacterial infections. 
just right here in this in this process and you just don't know it's there. Also, there's a lot of warning about if you have grapes that are not a little deficient in nitrogen, you should add some nitrogen. That's the yeast nutrient. So it's a good thing to put in there. It doesn't hurt anything. Can you overdose on these things? Yes, you can, but almost every one of the chemicals has how much to use right on it. You stay within that, you're fine. Okay? And usually it's a quarter teaspoon or a teaspoon or something along that line. And if you don't know the conversions, I would suggest uh, that they actually they're on the bat last page of our handout. I think I put some conversions in there, uh, or they're somewhere. Or you get a normal cookbook, and you're going to find out that a tea, there's three teaspoons per tablespoon, two tablespoons per ounce, and we go up. Now, eight fluid ounces per cup, 16 cups per gallon, etc. We have a very strange system with the American system. The metric system is so much simpler and easier. You just divide by 10. The problem is, just for fun, uh, you realize the, the metric system is the official system for the United States? Yeah. 1859. Uh-huh. We've been on it for 150 years plus. We're just a little slow in implementing it. <laughs> but it's still simpler. Okay. Once we get everything in there and get things going, you need to be able to keep the fruit flies out of there. With this, here's a real simple way to do that. Again, a very expensive tool called a trash sack. Right around the side. It fits tight enough on this that you really don't have to do anything else. Or you can get one of those, uh, it's either a large rubber band from Office Depot or a, a trash bag band from Walmart for another 60 cents or so. Yeah, anything like that, or even a bungee cord does it, does the work just to hold it on there. That keeps the fruit flies out of there and keeps you from having your wine, you know, go bad later on. Um, every time you need to uh, stir it, you just pop this off, pick this up, stir it, off you go. The prime plastic is, is okay to use, or yeah. not. No, no, not that. Oh. Just a primary. just a white plastic. White yeah, white plastic is fine. You can even do uh, some of this in um, plastic uh, water jugs. Anything that's potable water approved, and this is, okay, believe it or not. And now as you scale up a little bit, all of a sudden you've got a whole bunch of stuff you want to do, and you want to do 200 gallons, you can go down to the uh, local sprayer company, irrigation company, and get food-grade high-density polyethylene tanks up to 8,000 gallons. And they work perfectly fine, okay? Um, and there's some special ones that are made that the lids are a special type to do such and such so and so. But by and large, yeah, there's, you can scale up very nicely. It's food, any food grade plastic is perfectly fine. Another thing you're going to need, and uh, I, I'm going to be chauvinistic here for a second, guys. You need one of two things, a lot of money or a forgiving wife. Because you can pilfer stuff from the kitchen and you may have to replace it, you may not. You need a long-handled spoon. Now, this works, pilfer from the kitchen, but if you'll notice, if I'm mixing up, this isn't even five gallons. If I'm mixing up five gallons, that works a lot better, okay? I'm liable to get a little wet doing this, uh, but that's okay. You're going to need to be able to take samples of this as you go along to put in the hydrometer, and that we use what we call a wine thief. Now, this is a commercially one, commercial one that's seven bucks. It looks suspiciously like an overgrown straw, which is exactly what it is. And all you have to do is put it in here. Put it, we've all done this as a kid, and there you go. That, that's how you draw your wine out, your sample, and you put it in your hydrometer jar so you're able to tell. By the way, this is wine. It's got to taste good. So occasionally you need to taste it along the way too. You know, it's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it. So that's the quality control. Uh, so, you need, <laughs> so you need a long-handled spoon. Uh, you can find these at wine shops. Sometimes you can find them at kitchen stores. They're, again, they're not horribly expensive, but they are kind of handy. Uh, restaurant supply, yeah. Um, you're gonna, and there's another type of wine thief, okay, that you can go to Walmart for. It's going to look suspiciously like a turkey baster, a buck sixty-nine, 
Uh, and that's exactly right. I mean, it works great. It works the exact same way. But remember to wash it. Wash all these things. And if you're concerned about any kind of grease or anything, use Dawn detergent. It's wonderful for getting rid of grease. And rinses off very nicely. Okay. By the way, guys, for growing elderberries, uh, we get a mite that, grow, that blows in and curls the leaves. We use a cup of Dawn detergent, 100 gallons of water, put it through the, the blast sprayer. So we're out there blowing bubbles all up and down that place. Works out. A uh, cup of Dawn detergent, and uh, I think it's 100 gallons of water. And you're spraying the bushes with that? Well, yeah, takes care of the mites. And I believe that's even organically certified, but, okay. Okay, so let's go back to our recipe here for a second. Where were I? There we go. So we've managed to come up with the fruit. We've talked about sugar. And the problem with the sugar is knowing when you've got it dissolved. Okay, sugar dissolves very well. But if you're in here and you see how dark this is already, it's a little hard to tell if there's any sugar left or not. And I can tell you when you're doing it in a several thousand gallon tank, it's a real pain to try to figure out if it's all dissolved. So this is where that notebook is really, really critical because you know the last time you did these elderberries and you put in two pounds of sugar, you got this specific gravity. And if you're not there yet, then you know you've got to be doing some more stirring. Okay? Or... The second time you do it, or the third time or fourth time, you mix it, the water and the sugar right off the bat, or most of it, so that you know, you know, so it's easier to see when you're doing that. So you don't have to dissolve as much. Because when you figure if this was five gallons and I'm going to add two pounds per gallon, that's ten pounds of sugar. That's a lot of sugar to get dissolved in there. Okay, it's actually, that's about 20% sugar at that point. So, the um, thing is, just dissolve it up uh, and just make certain it's all dissolved. Uh, the acid, we'll talk about digesting that in a little bit. And um, the rest of these things, you just throw in there up front. You want to put everything you can up front. So the uh, one Camden tablet or one twentieth of a teaspoon of powder. <laughs> You can't measure it, so usually we take a quarter teaspoon for five gallons of SO2 powder. That gives you 45 parts per million. And I've got this in one of the handouts, by the way. Um, and um, so if, you, if you're only going to do three gallons, you can put that in water and then just take three-quarters of it, or three-fifths of it, 60% of it, and dump it in there. Pectic enzyme, this helps you clarify your wine. Later on, we're trying to bottle it and get it stable and everything. There are several different hazes, several different reasons why your wine won't clarify out. One is pectin. We want to get the pectin out of there. That's why if anybody's tried to make wine jelly before, it takes a lot more pectin. There's no pectin in the fruit. We've stripped that out. Uh, yeast nutrient. Uh, there's several different ones around. There's one called yeast energizer. There's yeast nutrient. You need yeast nutrient itself is basically diammonium phosphate fertilizer. Okay, uh, the, the energizer type thing is diammonium phosphate with vitamin B, uh, B vitamins and yeast holes. In other words, dead yeast. Okay, there's the yeast food. Uh, we actually put in extra yeast holes in our, some of our fermentations, depending. Um, but again, you want to put that right on in, and it, you, can, you can do it two or three times. You cannot overdose on that, but just go with what the recommendation is there, or a little bit more. You know, if you're doing elder flower or rose flower petal wine or something like that, you're going to need more nutrient because there's no nutrition in that flower. You're using the flower. We use the flowers as a flavoring component only. We put everything else in there, the water, the sugar, the acid, and the nutrients and everything else. Somebody asked me about distilled water. I do not recommend using distilled water because you need the trace minerals in there from your water. That helps the yeast grow. You can do it, but I wouldn't recommend it. Also, you don't want to have distilled water because it typically doesn't have any oxygen in it. But remember, the yeast needs oxygen. That's why we're stirring. So, uh, And lastly, the yeast. Again, there's an awful lot of yeast out there. The yeast will tell you how to use it on the packet. And the whole fermentation process is used in not only wine, but cheese, bread, 
and a lot of other foods. Do not use bread yeast. It's not alcohol tolerant. Our yeast, and again, 100 years ago, was kind of an, an interesting deal. Our wild yeast would eat up to about where they produce 12% alcohol. Alcohol turns out to be a poison to the yeast. So this is a natural self-limiting process. So we ended up with about 12% alcohol wines all the time. Our cultured yeast today will go up to 18%. 100 years ago, if you had a 26 bricks or 26% sugar fruit or must, the yeast would take 20 of that, form 12% alcohol, and you had 6% residual sugar left over. There was no yeast left alive, so it wasn't going to re-ferment, so that's how they got sweet wines. Today, we, because the yeast will go all the way up to 18%, we have to make certain it gets stopped. That's why you want to put only the sugar in there that you want, and then we make certain the yeast is dead before we start sweetening it. And that's why you also use potassium sorbate so that you don't have to worry about that. Is what? No. No, beer yeast is for beer. Bread is for bread and prisoners. <laughs> they, they use it a lot. Uh, wine yeast is, is for wine. And again, the yeast is incredibly important and it gives you a whole variety of flavors. We were just doing a, a yeast trial and every time we do a new wine, we'll do up to 20 different yeasts. And even then, our elderberry, we're still trying different yeasts. And we've tried probably 30 on it in various times. Yeah? What yeast do you use? Oh, that's one of the secrets. But I'll tell you what you guys want to use. <laughs> the, the yeasts that are available to you easily as a winemaker, an amateur winemaker, are these three I have here. I like the Law of N yeast. There's also Red Star. And they're all, they're, they're kind of the, the standard, the original standards, okay? Um, there's three here. One's called K1. Um, that's actually for red grape, okay? And by the way, it eats, it eats sugar. It doesn't care whether it's fructose or glucose. Doesn't care. Um, if you're going to do a white wine, this is called a kind of a champagne yeast. It's EC1118. And you go into the wine store, the, the Red Star has their same ones. One's Epernay, one's Montrachet, and one's something or other else. Um, and then we use 71B for a lot of the fruit wines. Okay? And 71B would be the one I would suggest you start with. And I can eat very, if you want to have a real fun time, just try these three yeasts. Do, do a quart and put one in each one of them. And you'll quickly find out you don't want to use these two on elderberries. They, they, you want 71B. It brings out the fruit flavor more. So, um, like I said, there's 1,800 wine yeast, and so the, the one you would, you, unless you're going to spend a lot of money and have a, a and you're a commercial winery, you can't even get to it. So, yeah. Well, I'm just noticing in your jar here, I'm assuming as a baker, yeah. that this is yeast in the this water, and you're showing us this little tiny packet. So, mm -hmm. this is, this is, well, that's 80 cents. That does five gallons of wine. Okay. Don't skimp on the yeast. <laughs> it's one of the cheapest things to do. Now, this is just a demonstration type thing. And that's actually bentonite in there. Um, that's the other thing is, is a protein haze. And for grapes, you get a lot of that. So they routinely put bentonite, dirt, clay, in the water um, up front to help precipitate all that out. Uh, I use this to be able to show you what, what goes on in the process. Okay. Does it enhance the, min enhance the mineral content of the water? Or it, it would a little bit because it's, it's bentonite clay. It really it, It's fairly inert, they say. And you filter it out. So, you know, we're going to let this stuff settle and we're going to filter things and that helps, that helps get the, the, the grainy stuff out for you. So, okay. Uh, again, yeast, it all depends. We did a, um, a yeast trial for a honey wine, and I did uh, six different yeasts, and all six of them were totally different colors and different flavors. Honey happens to be something you want to ferment slowly, so the fast fermenting yeast tasted really, really bad. The slow fermenting yeast tasted good. So you're going to slow ferment. You're going to, there's a whole variety of variables you've got to deal with here to really make quality wines. Okay? 
And um, when I say that, we won over 500 international awards with our wines over the 17 years. And every one of our wines has won a gold medal in an international competition someplace. We really don't release them until they do. So, um, now, you may not like one of them. That's okay, but at least they're correctly made. Yeah? At what point are you checking your sugar content of the elderberries? Did you put them in the bag there? Start yep, the yep. You doing that with, the, with your hydrometer? Yep, the yep, with the hydrometer. So now we're getting ready to do that. And also, but I see lunch is coming soon, so what's the, what's the, what's the, how much more time do I have before we start that? Whatever I want. Okay, well in that case we're going to get people up a little bit. Now you're going to learn how to use the hydrometer. Because we've now put our, we put our water in here, and we put some of our sugar, because I know it's going to take some, and I couldn't see very well. Uh, and then we put our elderberries in here, and it's going to be about five shades darker than that when you get, you know, when you start putting the elderberry juice in there. So uh, we've got everything put together. Now we're going to test what the sugar level is because I want to set it um, where we, you know, I basically want to set it to get the alcohol level. And I think that may be the next slide down through there somewhere. Okay, to use this thing, there's just some quick tips for using. Like any other tool, you need to calibrate it. The, uh, these were, believe it or not, we, everything, our tools are calibrated for working in caves. No joke. So they're calibrated at 60 degrees temperature. But who has a 60 degree temperature cave that they're working in? Not many of us. So they do a lot on the literature about worrying about the temperature compensation, things like that. You don't care. It doesn't make any difference. Now, it took me a long time to figure this out. It doesn't make any difference, okay? Um, because it makes one difference in the graduation, you're not going to be that accurate anyhow, okay? Um, my clicker go. There we go. Now, this gives you an idea of what we're trying to do. This is, and this is on, your, on this particular hydrometer. It's got three different scales. Degrees, balling, or bricks, that's really percent sugar. The other is specific gravity. That means what is its density versus that of water. And the last thing is potential alcohol. So if you look over here at, and this is actually, this is designed, this table is designed for sugar in water. And is actually a little low for what goes, actually goes on in, in wine must. Because it was also designed for 54% conversion factors and for the yeast, and then we're really up to 62% today. So just assume that 20, 20 bricks here, I mean, it used to be 22 bricks gave you 12.5% sugar. 20 bricks with our new wine yeast will give you 12.5% sugar. So in either case, you look here, you say 20 bricks, specific gravity should be 1.08, and I'm going to make it 11.5%. Really, you're going to make 12.5% sugar. Okay? Uh, alcohol, I'm sorry. All right. That's what we're shooting for. So what we're going to do is we're going to Take the uh, hydrometer, and the first thing we want to do, like I said, is calibrate it. How do you calibrate it? This is where you want that distilled water. Room temperature distilled water. Pour that in there. It should read one. Guess what? <laughs> I haven't found one that reads one yet. <laughs> okay? We don't care. If it reads 1.002, just realize that's one, and just compensate correctly. That's all you have to do. It's really, really simple to do. Okay? But you need to calibrate it first, or otherwise you're going to be off just a little bit. Not a whole lot, a little bit. Because um, again, if you look by going by making this go two, you went from 11.5 to 11.21. So three tenths of a percent alcohol. That's a little, but that's not too much. Okay? So, first thing you do is calibrate it. Now, this tool is really, really neat because when we first set the sugar, it's going to, you're going to get, when the yeast eats it all, you're going to get that amount of alcohol. And that scale will read just slightly different than this chart, but it's close enough. And so we ferment to dryness, then we stabilize it and sweeten it back if we want to have a sweeter wine. So first off, we, uh, we set the alcohol content by the, by the specific gravity. Second thing we do, then is we watch our progress. Because we know we started at 1.08, 1.02, 1.03, 1.04, 1.05, 1.06, 1.07, 1.08, 1.09, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18
And you go down there and you measure it the next day and it's 1.07. Then it's 1.06. Okay? The, the point that we want to transfer is 1.03. Okay? The first part of the fermentation is what we call the violent fermentation stage. And it will, it's really violent. It bubbles and churns and everything else. Uh, so, the first few days, and it takes anywhere from three to five days to get down to 1.03. This is a guideline. During the fermentation process, you are producing carbon dioxide. This is protecting the wine. All right? So, you don't have to worry about the oxygen getting in there. At that point, the carbon dioxide is protecting it. Once we get down to a point that we're not producing as much carbon dioxide, that's when we want to put it into an anaerobic situation so we blanket it with carbon dioxide to keep it safe. That's called the secondary fermentation. So the primary goes down to about 1.03, okay? And you see you used up about two-thirds of your sugar. Now, it's going down 0.1, and you're going to go to a meeting for a couple, three days, and you go, boy, if it's going that fast, I need to, I'm, but it's only 1.06 right now, or 1.05, but it's going to be too low when I get back, go ahead and transfer it. It's just a guideline. It's not a hard and fast rule, okay? Uh, you just may not get as much flavor from your fruit if you got whole fruit in there by giving it another day or two. But if it's that or spoil your wine, I'd rather have a little less flavor. Now, you went ahead and went, and you get back, and it's 1.01. .01. Now what do you do? You transfer it. Okay? You're still producing carbon dioxide. Okay? Now, you go, and it, it ran away from you, and you come back, and it's not bubbling at all. Okay, it's dead. What do you do? You transfer it. <laughs> okay. And you go down to your local grocery store and get yourself a little carbon dioxide, in other words, dry ice, and put a couple little chunks of dry ice in there and let that carbon dioxide then fill up the, uh, the tank. Okay? So there's a lot of ways to take care of that. Once we get, and by the way, the other thing is, this is designed for sugar and water. Alcohol... You're producing alcohol. Alcohol is nine-tenths the density of water. Once you start producing alcohol, you have no real clue about how much sugar is really there. The accuracy is gone because now you've got a solution of sugar, water, and alcohol. Which means that the ending point, you would think, I use up all the sugar, I'm going to get down to one. No, you get down to 0.992 underneath. Okay? You'll also find that 0.992 is about 2% sugar lower than, if you will, zero. So if you want to sweeten back, you add enough sugar to get that up to, to 1.000, you got 2% sugar. If you want 10% sugar, you just go up 10, 10 graduations on there, you got 10% sugar. So if you ever had a, if you know there's a neat wine that you like and you want to know how much sugar is in it, take your hydrometer. Pour it in there, and you can find out very, very quickly what the sugar level is in that wine. So you can reverse engineer it real easily. Yeah? When you do the moving the material from the primary to secondary, the secondary is the carboy. Yes. Okay, now, uh, I don't know when, again, just flag me whenever, but we're going to get ready to transfer it from, we're, we're done with the primary. You know, we're, we're down to 1.03, and we need to transfer it. There's a very, very special tool that you need called a, called a funnel. You dump it all in. The books will tell you you've got to siphon it off and do this and do that. No, what yeast residue is in there is actually food for the surviving yeast, so you just dump it all in. Now, we started by making five gallons, or what we think is going to be five gallons, but you notice I added sugar. And I added 10 pounds of sugar. And at my 13.2 pounds for a gallon, I've got about three quarters of an extra gallon of volume sitting here. Now, I've used up some of that because the yeast has eaten the sugar, turned it into carbon dioxide, which is blown off. But there's still more than five gallons. What do I do? You have your extra handy-dandy gallon jug. Okay? And this can be a plastic one. So that plastic water jug. Whatever you doesn't go fit in here, you put in here. And you're going to fill this up to about here. 
okay? You don't want it all the way up because it's still bubbling, or you hope it's bubbling. The rest of it you put in that jug, okay? Um, and, then, and then literally you just dump it all in there. And it's going to look really weird. I can tell you that the, an easy description for elderberry wine while it's fermenting, it looks like blood. That's, that's what it looks like, okay? When you do it, you'll, you'll understand. It looks just blood. Um, dump it in there. You're going to start seeing this layer form. Now, I use bentonite to form this layer. This is my approximation of the yeast. Normally, it's not that much. It's down, down to here somewhere. But then you'll notice it's graduated out, and we're going to separate off the good wine from the dead yeast and stuff later on called racking. And I'll, again, we'll show you how to do that. Uh, but that's, this is the reason I have this here, just to make it look like the yeast, so that you understand that once you see this big, thick layer, which takes about two weeks to two months, okay, uh, then you rack it off. And you'll rack it a second time, then bottle. Yeah. Those fast uh, fermenters, do they have to be glass or plastic? Well, it all depends on how long you're going to keep it. Some people, when they're making the wine, you know, in a couple of weeks they're drinking it, <laughs> and then plastic is fine. The plastic water jugs. This this used to be all the water came in glass jugs. Um, if you're going to keep your wine for more than about two months, you better put it in glass, okay? Uh, or some other container, like if you've got access to a stainless steel beer keg. I mean, you can use those. Anything that's impervious to oxygen. The, the normal water bottles are not, and they'll leak oxygen in there, and that can create some problems for you. Now, my second jug over here I was talking about, you can have that as plastic because you're only going to have that in there a couple weeks maybe three, and then you're going to transfer it out, and that's, that's fine for that. But any long-term storage, you want to have glass. I have a question with this plastic. There's a, there's a triangle on the food grade uh, plastic containers, and they have one in there. And is there a, with all others, like all these water uh, carboys at the uh, mm -hmm. cell, and I made wine in that, and it worked, but then another batch didn't work. And I wonder, is there any chemical rea reaction if you, even within two months when you, you do the primary no, it, it's fermentation, is there any chemical reaction between your wine uh, process mm. and the plastic that don't show number one on the uh, Not that I know of. But the problem is you've got oxygen transport through that plastic. They're not really designed to exclude oxygen. Food grade high density polyethylene is, but the poly, poly whatever it is that they use for the, the normal one, uh, jugs are not. So how does your garbage can? Uh... Because you're producing carbon dioxide here and it's, what's, it's excluding the oxygen. Oh, okay. Okay? That's, it's just the fact that the, those, those water jugs will, you can do it part of the time, part of the time you can't. Food grade buckets work too. Do you, have, okay. do you have a time frame for that primary? Pr primary is typically up to about five days. Okay. okay? Um, now, depending on a particular fruit, we may soak that for two weeks. So we have primary and secondary together. We have the ability to close off the tank and make it go anaerobic and leave the fruit in there, and then we transfer it later on. That's all some of the techniques that you can come up with later on with equipment. But for home wine making now, this is the best, the best method to keep you from getting too many mistakes. <coughs> Sir? What do you add to bentonite? Right up front. Right. Yeah. For grapes, you typically need to do that. For most other fruits, you really don't. Uh, we've only seen... I think rhubarb one time gave us a problem uh, that we had to do something with. But you can also use these fining agents later on. But for grapes, they always put it in right up front because they know they're going to use it. Okay? And that's some of the experience, too. If you, you make something and you find out, oh, gee, I need to fine it with bentonite, okay, then the next time you make it, you put the bentonite in up front. You, know? you find that you need icing glass, put it in up front. Uh, I can understand bentonite being a fining agent 
You can imagine the guy out here with, with you know, clay on his boots and he's working around the wine. Some of it dumps in there and helps clarify his wine. I can understand that. Isinglass is fish bladder. I don't know who came up with that one. <laughs> okay. Then we've got some new chemical ones that are, you know, higher tech that work really well for certain things, but that, that kind of gets into the, the advanced winemaking, which is kind of out of our scope.